subject this morning. Your offense of today will be your downfall of tomorrow. Your offense of today will be your downfall of tomorrow. Mm. With that being the case, let's, let's go ahead and read our scripture lesson for this morning. The Gospel of the St. Luke, chapter 17, verse 1, and it says, Then said he unto the disciples, and this is Jesus speaking, It is impossible, but offense will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. Jesus lets us know that you cannot stop offense from coming. It is going to come. Mm -hmm. It may come in a big form, it may come in a little form, but it is coming. So since we know that it's coming, it is not our objective to stop it from coming. We're wasting our time. Our objective is to make sure we don't accept the offense when it comes. Mm -hmm. I look at offense like a telemarketing call in your house or somebody coming to your house and you don't know they're coming. And so they're coming uninvited. Uh -huh. Telemarketers call your house, you know they're calling, they, they weren't invited to call. And the people who come to your house just, oh, I was just in the neighborhood, I just wanted to drop by. <laughs> yeah, right. But they come uninvited. But you have the power to invite them in or to tell them you need to come back to you have a power to tell the telemarketer, no, don't call my house anymore. Although you cannot stop them from coming, you can stop them from coming into your house. And offense is the same way. You can't stop it from coming, but you can stop it from entering your house. When I began to, re began to think about this, I thought about a new edition song, Mr. Telephone Man. There's something wrong with my line. Every time I call my baby's number, I get click every time. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them click, click. That's what you need to do to a fence. Every time I call, you need to click, click. You don't need to even answer the phone. You need to call your, your you need to see your ID card and say, it's a fence. I'm not answering. I'm not, I'm not letting it in. Because if I let it get anywhere close to me, it's going to render me powerless. And I can't afford in this day and time uh -huh. to be powerless. Well the word offense in the New Testament comes from the Greek word shakalom, originally meaning the name of the part of a trap to which the bait is attached, the bait stick. Hence the trap of, or snare itself. The word also carries the meaning of a stomach block, something that becomes a hindrance and causes people to fall away from their faith in Jesus Christ. An offense, is used, an offense usually occurs when you see, hear, experience a behavior that is so different from what you expected that it causes you to flutter, to totter, to wobble in your soul. In fact, you are so stunned by what you have deserved or by a failed expectation that you lose your footing emotionally. And before you know it, you are dumbfounded, flabbergasted about something. Mm -hmm. And then your shock turns to disbelief, your disbelief turns into disappointment, and your disappointment turns into offense. So we can't stop it from coming but I can stop it from entering my house. Uh -huh. yes. And the quickest way a church becomes powerless, it allows offense to come in. And can I say this? I know some of you may disagree with. Can I say this? It usually starts from the head and goes on down. I know many pastors wouldn't tell you that because that means it's throwing the blame on them. But it usually starts from the head and goes on down. Uh -huh. Go ahead, sir. Because you usually follow the head. That's right. Anybody got a head on their body? No, your body don't go one way, your head goes another. <laughs> if it does, I don't want to be around you. <laughs> so wherever your head goes, your body goes. Uh -huh. And if the head gets offended, the rest of the body is going to be contagious and catch a hold of that and get offended also. Yes, man. Mm -hmm. Amen. So 
when it comes to churches having no power or being offended, it has to start with the head. So we can't allow offense to come into our pathways. And many of the times when we begin to deal with offense, it is different than unforgiveness because the offense leads to unforgiveness. And I've dealt with unforgiveness in a previous sermon when we were dealing with the issues of life, but this is somewhat different. Your offense will lead to the unforgiveness. Something caused you to get emotionally unstable. Something caused you to cause your emotions to rise up. And now every time you think about the situation or the person, you are thinking about them in the pattern of how they hurt you. So even when they do something good, you don't see it because all you think about is how they hurt you. You. That's why churches become powerless when the head becomes offended because nothing nobody does is good because they're only seeing it through the eyes of being hurt. And until you take those hurt glasses off, you really can't see clearly. So many of you may say, well, Pastor, you don't know how that made me feel. You don't know what happened. You don't know this. You don't know that. And can I use that quote from WWE The Rock? It doesn't matter what they did to you. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, sir. It doesn't matter how they hurt you. Yeah. Because you are the only one keeping yourself in a cage. Mm -hmm. Because your own glasses of hurt has you only in one certain area. And you can't get out. Yes, sir. And so you like the person at the club. You know, you see them at the club doing this. So you're in the cage. All you're doing is going around. <laughs> going around. <laughs> going around. Thank you doing something, but ain't moving nowhere. Yeah. I'm looking good, but you're offended going around in the cage. My God. And the bad part about it is the person on the outside doesn't don't have the key. Amen. <laughs> you're like, let me out, let me out. I let you out when well, you got the key in your pocket. Uh, and all you got to do is reach in your pocket and unlock the cage and let your own self out. So your offense of today will be your downfall of your tomorrow. Can I show you an example in the world? Go with me to the gospel court of St. John. Gospel according to St. John, chapter 12. Chapter 7, I'm sorry. I mean, chapter 12, verse 7, I apologize. Gospel according to St. John, chapter 12, verse 7. Actually, I want to start a little bit up. Actually, I want to start at the first verse, I'm sorry. Chapter 12. Begin at the first verse. Let me give you the history behind this. The proof is. Jesus, when you read the word, was anointed by someone three times. Once in the beginning of his ministry. Twice during the week before he was crucified. This particular passage of scripture deals with the second anointing of his life. But the first anointing during the week before he was to be crucified. Look what the Bible says. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him supper. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with, Jesus, with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, a spice of very costly, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Then he said not that he, this he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then Jesus said, let her alone. Against the day of my burial alone, 
against the day of my burial has she kept this. For the poor ye have with you, but me ye not, but me ye have not always. This right here, Pastor, I'm gonna stop right there. Because we're going to see another thing in the second, in the third launching, but the second of that week. This is where Judas first gets offended. Because Jesus dares to tell him, leave this woman alone. Don't worry about what she's doing. Because she is anointing me for my burial. Yes, you don't see Judas move right now. But go with me to the gospel according to St. Mark. The 14th chapter. And we want to look at the third verse. Because remember I told you there's three anointings of Jesus. The first one in the beginning of his ministry. The second one we read in the Gospel according to St. Mark. But this one we're going to read in the Gospel according to St. John. This one we're going to read in the Gospel according to St. Mark is his third anointing. You see he's in a different place. The scripture we just read, he was in Mary's, in Lazarus' house. But look whose house he's in now. The third verse, Mark 14 and 3. And being in Bethlehem, still in the same place, but in a different house. In the house of Simon the leper, as he sat and meet there, came a woman. Now this is a different woman, because we read in the previous scripture that Mary anointed his hair. And he was in Mary and Martha's in a lot in Lazarus' house. But now he's in Simon's house. Mm -hmm. And a different woman comes, having an alphabet box of anointment, a spice, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. Notice here, she anointed his feet in the second anointing. This lady anoints his head. And there, that, and there was some that had indignation. Otherwise, in other words, they were offended within themselves and said, why was this waste of anointment made? For it may have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the people and they murmured against her. Stop right there. Doesn't that sound like the same thing Jesus said in the previous chapter? Yes. A different anointing but the same offense. And Jesus says, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She has worked a good work on me. For ye had the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She has done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burial. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever this gospel shall be preached, Throughout the whole world, this also that she has done should be spoken for a memorial of her. Notice the 10th verse. And Judas of Israel, yeah. one of the 12, went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. His offense caused him to betray the man that had done everything for him. It was he got offended the first time. Because Jesus told him to leave the woman alone. But in his second anointing, he's also offended. And he's so offended now, he said, forget all this. I'm going to betray him. Mm -hmm. And notice the offense is all over money. <laughs> he got 30 pieces of silver. Which would have made, maybe made up for how much they could have sold their, their ointment for. And put in the bag that he could have stole out of. Betray the man that was feeding him, taking care of him, made him something that he was not. They knew he was a thief. Uh -huh. Well, Jesus knew he was a thief when he called him a disciple. That's right. But he didn't look at what he was. He looked at what he could make him. Yes. He looked at what he could be. Uh -huh. And took him into the fold. And the man got offended over something and betrayed Jesus. Mm. 